jot. <laughs> no, I, I I will send you you I will send you the link. All the PowerPoint, all of that. Recording all that. Okay, chapter twenty-five. Wise words from Hezekiah's men. As chapter 24 ended, that was the last that was written and arranged by King Solomon. But as I mentioned, there were also others, many others that uh, Solomon wrote and they were put together, like in this instance, chapter 25, by Hezekiah's men. Now, who was King Hezekiah? King Hezekiah from Judah was a good king and he brought about reforms in Judah and he got the people to turn away from their evil ways to God and in the process he had his men to gather all the teachings, the law the, 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 the word of God and they assemble this Hezekiah's men, they assemble these words of Solomon for our benefit. So that is a very brief introduction to chapter 25. Wise words from Hezekiah's men. These are the Proverbs, verse 1, of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. So very clear, right? Eh? So if you want to know all the reforms that happened during Hezekiah's time, you go and read Second Chronicles chapter 29, 30 and 31. Second Chronicles chapter 29, 30 and 31. If not, you, you listen back to the recordings that we did quite a few years ago. Verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. Understand? It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. Now, do we understand everything? No. That's why there is Deuteronomy 29, 29. Right? Who doesn't know Deuteronomy 29, 29? The secret things of the Lord belong to Him. You all know that one, right? Okay. Then let me introduce you another. More positive one. Romans 11.33 Romans 1.133 See, today I'm so nice to you. I'll give you all the easy numbers. <laughs> That's not easy till 3. 3.3 three. Okay, now Romans 1.133 one, one, three, three. Romans 11 verse 33 Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has become, become His counsellor? Or who has given, first given to Him and He shall repay to Him? For of Him, and through Him, and to Him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Mm. So in other words, cannot search out everything. The depths of, his, of, the, of wisdom and knowledge are beyond us. So, back to chapter 25, verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. But it does not mean we don't go and search it out. But the glory of kings is to search out a matter. I'll give you a recent example. I think two or three Sundays ago, we had uh, Brother Freddie Boy who came. Yes. Right? An engineer by training, a scientist by vocation. And he brought out the signs in the Bible that gives us a better understanding of even Genesis chapter 1. How the physical structure and all these things, it, they did not happen uh, 
because two big stones came together, bang, and then wow, suddenly you got the universe. It is God. But according to Brother Andrew Go, I mean they're all friends, we're all friends, he said, Freddy Boy took many hours to research in order to present to us that now we remember, wow, who taught us Freddy Boy? Wow, great man of God, you know, wonderful guy who really search out the truth, dig deep and give it to us simply. Glory. But the glory of kings. Kings, this kings refers to what? Men. Men. Leaders. And Brother Freddy Boy is a leader in his own right. In his field, but also an elder in his church, River of Life. But the glory of kings is to search out a matter. So, you and I, you and I, ought to spend time to dig the well. Go deep so that the waters are deep within. You search it out and draw it out. Okay? So, verse 3. As the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of kings is un searchable. So heavens for height and the earth for depth. Can measure. Cannot measure. So the heart of kings is unsearchable. So in other words, the heart of leaders are unsearchable. You don't know. You really don't know. Is it for good or for evil? We don't know. We, we cannot assume everyone is good. And we read enough that Example in the northern kingdom of Israel, how many good kings? Tita, none. In the southern kingdom, five. So we do not know. We, 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 we can't tell. So what then do we do? Pray for them. Pray for your leaders. Pray for your government leaders. Pray for your church leaders. Pray for them. Because they can't search everything of God. So they don't know. Then when they don't know and they have no wisdom, no knowledge, then you know what they do? Like in the book of Judges, they did what was right in their eyes. And so, the nation will fall. So verse 4, Take away the drawers from silver and it will go to the silversmith for jewelry. Take away the wicked from before the king and his throne will be established in righteousness. So take away the dross. The dross is the impurity. They don't want the dross when they burn and put the, the silver through the fire. It's so that the, the impurities will all surface, right? And they all be removed. And likewise, and no, and after this, it will go to the silversmith for jewelry. There, the pure silver will be used for jewelry. Likewise, we are the redeemed. We are the forgiven. And so, our things of the past, our ways of the past, we have divorced from them. The dross has been gone. And silver is the color of redemption. You know, silver is the color of redemption. We studied this when we did Exodus and we did uh, the construction of the tabernacle and the gold and the silver and the bronze and so on. So this brass, bronze on the outside, outer court, that is judgment. Silver, where the inner court is, that is redemption. And then gold, in the holy place, the most holy place, that is purity. So, and you will go to the silversmith. So speaking about us, we have been forgiven. We have been redeemed. Take away from the wicked from before the king, and his throne shall be established in righteousness. Eventually, eventually, the unrighteous will have their place in the lake of fire. And you read in Revelation,
Revelation 21, Revelation 22, who will be before the King and the Lamb of, I mean, the, the Lamb of God. Yeah. And He is the light. And the sun is there. S-O-N is there. Don't need the S you have. And the elders will be there. And then we will be there. His throne shall be established in righteousness. Verses 6 and 7 speaks of humility. Do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king. And do not stand in the place of the great. In the presence of your king, <coughs> you boast. You exalt yourself. Brag. That is not humility. And do not stand in the place of the great. You go, you go to Istana, you must know where you are supposed to stand and where you are supposed to sit. Yeah, you take the wrong seat, huh? PMD, come, can you shift a bit? <laughs> wrong place, right? And Jesus also told us in Luke chapter 14. What did he say? Luke chapter 14, go to 7 11. Luke 14. So today, easier yeah, to remember. Luke 14, 7 to 11. 7 11, yes. He told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more, one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and he and him come. Uh, and he who invited you and him come and say to you, give place to this man, and then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you might do, you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humble. And he who humbles himself will be <coughs> exalted. This is kingdom principle. So, verse 7, For it is better that he say to you, Come up here, that, than that you should be put lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. So, don't promote yourself. Let God promote you. And uh, don't Google yourself now. Can you try Googling yourself? You key in your name. Alex and see whether <laughs> Google, Internet or anything about you. Now. <laughs> Once I did not key my name, wow. I'm not I'm not, not not so private anymore. Anyway. Verse 8. Do not go hastily to court. For what will you do in the end when your neighbor has put you to shame? No. Jesus also told us, huh? Don't try and settle it before you go to court. Why why should you want to go all the way? Still look. 30, 14, just now Luke 14, 31 to 32. Luke 14, 31, 32. Luke 14. Or oh, what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 that means he has 10,000 men to meet him who comes against him with 20,000 he is outnumbered he better sit down and do some thinking and planning or else when the other is still a great way off he sends a delegation with his tail between his legs and he asks conditions of peace. When he goes on the march and they say, wow, oh, hey, that guy uh, got 20,000, I only got 10,000. Then now, 
quickly sends a delegation and asks for condition of peace. How malu, how shameful, how embarrassing. Yeah? With the tail between the legs, quietly go. You should have done your homework, you should have done your planning. So that's what it says. So do not go hastily to court for what will you do in the end when your neighbor has put you to shame. So the best thing is don't. And Paul has a better advice for us. Not because of anything, but because of the eternal perspective. 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 1 to 7. Very good reason why we should not take another believer to court. Don't sue another believer. So sometimes I tell them, why why you do all this? Eventually we're going to judge everyone. Why you let the, the world judge us? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. Then any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning these uh, things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are at least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to law against brother and death before unbelievers. Shameful, right? Like what we saw last year and in the last few years. Shameful. Many, many years ago also there was this Calvary Charismatic Church also had this. And on and on. And all this, how did it end up in court? Because someone in the church not happy and went to the court to the outside to the authorities or whatever and so the whole thing blows up you mean you all cannot settle it within the church so right now people are mocking yeah why like that but anyway let's go back to here so that is verse 8. Verse 9. Debate your case with your neighbor. Personally. Personally. Debate with your neighbor. Why do I say personally? Because the next part says, and do not disclose the secret to another. Do not disclose the secret to another. That means between you and I. So, any problem, any issue, go and talk to him. And talk to him and not talk about him. Many times we fall into that, that sin, right? Wow, we are not happy. So we go around talking about him. But what did Jesus say? Matthew 18, 15. Matthew 18, 15. 1815. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell everyone. Is it? No. Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But Jesus also knows there are some people quite stubborn, right? So verse 16, But if you will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, 
then let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector whom the Jews despise. And this is not man's idea. This is kingdom principle. This is Jesus' instruction. And if within the church we can follow this, uh, we don't need to take another to call. Really. Really. But it is not so. So back to verse 9. So we are done with verse 9, verse 10. Lest he who hears it expose your shame and your reputation is ruined. Well, I can tell you, the reputation of not just that one church, but the reputation of the church in Singapore was ruined. I said, wow, you all got so much money. You all do this, you all do that. Anyway, next, verses 11 to 15. Verses 11 to 15 is about the power of the appropriate words. 11 to 15 and we will end after this. Okay? Because uh, otherwise, the roll speak cannot get started. <laughs> <laughs> the power of the appropriate words. Verse 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. A word, a word that is fitly spoken, that means the right word at the right time. Important, you may have the right word, but it is the wrong occasion. Also not good. So if it is done correctly, it is like apples of gold. Apples of gold in those days, when they serve, they serve on a silver tray. And then, for decoration, they have got this uh, 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 gold uh, things that they have molded in the form of fruits. So, cannot eat one, but just for decoration. Okay? Apple made of gold, you know, orange or whatever, you know, just made of and it is to decorate the thing. So it is a nice presentation, you understand? So the word spoken at right word at the right time, it is like a wonderful presentation. But more than that, spiritually, the word here is not misplaced. The word here is appropriate. Apples of gold. Gold is what? Purity. Purity. And then place on the silver plate, that is what? Redemption. We the dross has been taken from us. We are now gold. Royal gold. Yeah. And we are redeemed. So when you are forgiven and you say the right words and so on, it is like you are precious and preciously received and welcomed even in the presentation. Are you with me so far? Yes. Okay. Verse 12, like an earring, earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold is a wise rebuker to an obedient ear. So here we have someone who rebukes and someone who is receiving the rebuke. And this guy who rebukes is a wise guy. That means he says the right words, appropriate. But some people, the way they rebuke now, Wow, worse than Hitler, man. <laughs> School uh, from generation to generation. Uh. You know, they curse and that is not rebuking. Yeah. And uh, I think a few days back in the newspaper, a pastor had an accident on the road and challenged the other guy to fight. <laughs> yeah. I sent you the article. <laughs> I read the thing. Wow. I'm not pastor. <laughs> so, uh, Malu, man. Wait, but I thought you, you, you are spiritual leader, right? You know the word, right? But where's the fruit? You, you're not. See, knowledge uh, must drop down to the heart. Because out of the heart, the mouth speaker. 
So what did he have in mind when he challenged that guy to fight? Mm -hmm. But then again, I don't know. Reporters sometimes they exaggerate a bit. Mm -hmm. they, they blow up. We don't know. Maybe he's only a church staff, church worker. Mm -hmm. No, no excuse anyway. You know. But if you, if you put exaggerate his appointment, uh, that may not be very right. But it was a shocker. So, but if you rebuke that person and the year listening year is obedient, the guy listen. Oh yes, yes, yes. You're right. You're right. I, I, I'm sorry. I confess. I repent. Okay. Now, when this is communicated this way, this way, then whatever that was to be corrected, the person will wear, you know, like earring, and also like a necklace. That means this person will be outright in his uh, apology and he's not hiding. And it is going to be, yeah, it is a corrected situation. It is a corrected behavior. And the person is not ashamed. He wears it around his neck and he hangs it on his ear and it is stunningly beautiful and valuable, the correction. Verse 13. Verse 13. Like the coal of snow in time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him, for he refreshes the soul of his masters. Now, when is harvest? Harvest is between June and September. And it is very hot during that time, June to September. That's why we are going in November. Cooler. Not so hot. Now, when it is hot, eh, Israel is in Middle East. The Middle East is desert, you understand? <coughs> hot means very hot. Huh? And so, Mount Hermon in the north huh, got snow capped mountain. What snow? If someone would just bring some snow and come, if you just put it in your mouth, that is refreshing. If you use it to chill your drinks and whatever, it would be wonderful. You understand? It refreshes you, it quenches you, it cools you down. So that's what it means, like the cold of snow in time of harvest. is a faithful messenger to those who send him. So there are people who send this messenger. Okay, go and bring a message to the other party. For he refreshes the soul of his masters. I tell you, first, I'm the sender. I'm glad that he is going. I may not be in a position to go. It's, it's too uh, demanding of me physically. But he is going. Good. But also, the receiver. Because, like we read just now, Ezekiel chapter 3, Ezekiel chapter 33, and also, just now in the in the last chapter, yeah, don't hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughterhouse. The messenger went, and then those people who are stumbling to the slaughterhouse, when they hear the good news, that is also refreshing their soul. Otherwise, they will be on the way to hell, and that is also to refresh them. Or maybe they are pilgrims, maybe they are Christians, they are believers, but they are struggling. They are, they are going through some trials and some tests and so on. But a word of encouragement. You are the messenger. You bring the word of encouragement to them. That is repression. You understand? So in other words, be a blessing. Okay? Be a blessing. Say the right thing that to the person who needs it. Next, verse 14. It is about using your gift and not boasting about your gift. Whoever falsely boasts of giving is like clouds and wind without rain. You know who are the true givers? The true givers are the silent ones. But some will tell you, no, I donate to this, I donate to that. Make sure my name is right on the top. You give how much? 10,000. I give 10,001. So my name is above your name. There are people who do that. Anyway, we are not talking about we are not talking about money alone. But we are talking about spiritual gifts. So you 
have the gift, every one of us will have at least one. Use it. Don't boast about the gift. Otherwise, it is like clouds and winds are without rain. Clouds and wind without rain. Then what? It's, it is like skies that promise but never rain. Wow, so hot, it's so hot. This few days, highest temperature 36, 37. Look, wow, clouds are there. Hey, wait, wait, wait. Hot air, you understand? Hot air. A lot of hot air. So, promise what you can deliver. And deliver what you promise. Okay, last verse for today. Verse 15. By long forbearance, there is patience. A ruler is persuaded. And a gentle tongue breaks a bow. By long Patience. Some people need a bit more time to be persuaded. Not easily convinced. It takes time. So be patient. And a gentle tongue. But some people give ultimatum. Do it or die. You know, up to you. I'm not responsible for this anymore. And you walk away. No. Be patient. And exercise diplomacy. Diplomacy is important. When they arrested Jesus and he was brought before Pilate, was he screaming and shouting? He was quiet as a lamb before the slaughter. He could have, you know, called down the host of angels, right? He can, right? He could have asserted his, his authority and so on. And for him, in Matthew 21, who went into the temple and he threw out all the money changers who have turned the house of prayer into a den of thieves. He, one man or superman or one man, he threw out all these abangs, all these gangsters. You, you think all the money changers are nice guys? Huh? They are out there to cheat, right? You think they are nice guys? They are abangs. They are all over. But he threw them out. So who can hold him down? But he kept on. Okay. And a gentle tongue breaks the bone. So last reference, Matthew 5.5. 5. Matthew 5.5. 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, part of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Father, we ask that you will continue to help us to be meek, knowing that your hope is sure and certain that we will rule and reign with our Lord Jesus the days to come. And meanwhile, continue to help us to apply the wisdom, the knowledge with understanding as they come into our hearts and as we apply them even through our daily walk. Lord, let us be a blessing in words and in deeds to everyone that we come across. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.